guys, Biggs. Now, I just returned from a, another long trip. I was down south again, and um, I brought back some fish. Now, I bring back fish almost every single trip that I go, and I'm moving fish around all the time. And uh, I always make sure I declare everything, go through all the proper channels and stuff, but I'm always only bringing back a very small quantity for personal use. Now, when I'm transporting fish, my interest is mostly in uh, cichlids, live bears, and different things, tetras, weird stuff, and everything like that. I'm not as much of a catfish guy as a lot of you already know. Now, with catfish, that poses other challenges because they got real obvious spines and things like that. Now, because I'm traveling greater distances and I'm not bringing back boxes of fish, I prefer, personally, smaller fish. I can grow fish. Even if it's a big fish, if I can get fry that are smaller and I can grow them up, that's even better for me. Now, most people are used to using traditional fish bags. This is a nice one that's actually designed with a, a round bottom or something like that, so it has no corners. And traditionally, you'd fill that bag up with about a third water or a quarter water, and then you would either add air or oxygen, whatever, depending on the distance and the type of fish and how delicate it is, and you'd do the bag up. And then you would use some nice elastics, get the bag all ready to go, and then you'd put that in your fish box and so forth. And if, depending on the species, if you like, like catfish, cich bigger cichlids and stuff like that, you might want to double bag it. I'd reverse double bag it. It'd be nice. And I give it a little bit of give to it and stuff like that so it can handle the pressure changes when it goes up in the airplane. But I usually put stuff, I always transport a small little cooler when I'm, uh, when I'm traveling. And my small little cooler, this is one of the ones that I often travel with in, in good times of year when it's not super, super cold out. I do have a medical cooler which is a very, very heavy walled styrofoam. And I use that during the winter, winter months because my bag is out of my hands, out of my control. Once I check it in at the airline, it goes through a lot of stuff. I might sit on a cart for 20 minutes outside in the rain on the way to the plane. I wanna do the best that I can do. I do often travel with uh, heat packs and things like that. But the problem with the heat packs, when I'm only doing a small amount and a very small thing is they can often do more damage than good by actually overheating the bags and stuff. So. Now the thing that's new, unique is I often travel with these. These are a special type of bag. Now these bags, tro proper tropical fish bags, are also the same type of bags. They're made of the same materials they would be used for the food industry. And that's 100% virgin polyethylene, uh, low density polyethylene. And that's what good quality fish bags are made of. They have all the seals and stamping and everything like that for use for handling for fish, for live fish for food purposes, so USDA, FDA, all that sort of stuff. But good quality fish bags are indispensable. These ones, however, are an entirely different, unique, proprietary material. They got a very, very odd texture. And the really, really cool thing about these is they go by, they're originally developed by the company Cordon, uh, but you can buy them online through many different brands now. They feel very, very weird, unique. Uh, but these ones are actually form a semi or a permeable membrane that actually allows transmission of oxygen and CO2 through the bag. Now the big difference in these is these ones, traditional fish bags, a little bit of little bit of water in your fish, and then mostly air. These ones here, you put no air, no air. If you do that, it forms a gas bubble up top, and then it doesn't have the transpiration and stuff. This one here, you literally you're just going to put all water in the fish, and you just need a small amount, and that's going to do. Make sure your fish are cleaned out. And by cleaned out, what that usually means is that you're gonna let the fish not be fed in a clean environment, good clean water, and leave them for about 24 to 48 hours, depending on the size of the fish, depending on the species, depending on the temperature and the metabolism of said species. For most of the stuff that I transport, little baby cichlids, Central American cichlids, killies, that sort of stuff, basically 24 hours, that thing is cleaned right out and it's good. And honestly, in a breather bag, some of these things could probably go a full week. <laughs> so I just came back. I'm just gonna open up my box and see what came back and how it came back. My, uh, I noticed that uh, my little towel, now the one thing with breather bags is breather bags cannot touch each other. Little spot, not an issue, but for the most part, the bags should not be uh, rubbing against each other and everything. So I also just use a little bit of paper towel and everything's good to go. So now there is a single breather bag with about a one inch little tiny cichlid in it, Central American cichlid, very uncommon species. And he's doing absolutely great in his little bag. You notice there's no air in the bag and this whole little bag weighs next to nothing. I do have one little thing that I do put in is I put an absolute sliver, and I mean sliver, 
of Polyfilter. It's a very unique product that was actually made for kidney dialysis machines years ago, but it has great at wrap applications in the aquatic world for shipping fish because it absorbs all sorts of products and doesn't release them. So for our purposes, it works really, really good. And if you're going to be, if you can order Polyfilter, I'm sure you can order it online. You can order a big sheet of it. Uh, it's about $13, $15 US. Another little baby guy. Perfect little guy. He looks great. He's happy. No worse for wear. Now these ones, I brought in six of one species, and they're all about an inch in size, three quarters of an inch in size, and they were all individually bagged, and they're all looking great. And then the other species, they were decidedly smaller, so I've actually bagged all seven of them in one bag. And if you're dealing with small fry, especially if you were to say go collecting in the wild, and you want to go collect fish in the wild somewhere with all the proper paperwork and everything like that and bring bring fish back from the wild alive you could do that using these little breather bags they work great i don't know if you guys can see him he's right there little guy you see him he looks healthy and happy he's having a great time in there i'm going to give him a nice big tank these guys have got about a 40 breather it's all set up and waiting for them nice little guy again so that's one two three four five six of those and then these guys, there's actually seven of them in there. They're not as small as I, maybe I mentioned stuff like that, but they're, notice, no worse for wear. These guys are all good. This one's a really cool one that I've never, ever had before. It's a Cryptohero species, Autoflavus. It's very, very closely allied with uh, Nanialatus, and it's a very, very peaceful convict type, and it gets uh, bright, bright yellow like uh, Nanialatus. So maybe it might end up in one of the planted tanks. This one though, however, needs heated tanks, you know, 75, and the, pond, uh, the cold tank, it's a little bit cooler than that, it's room temperature around 70. So it's probably not gonna do as well in that tank. But we're gonna find a spot for it. I'm very, very thankful that I got these cool fish. Now, here's where the tricky part comes in. Landing fish. Everyone thinks it's easy. When you're working with normal fish bags, and you got your fish, and you're coming long distances, and you're dealing with vastly different water chemistry than what you may have at home, the best bet to deal with these type of situations, most people say, well, you just float the bag, and then we add some water. Hold on. Adding water can be super, super dangerous if you're not knowing what your chemistry of your water is. If your water in this bag uh, comes from really, really alkaline water. If you're used to dealing with Central Americans, live bears, Africans, something like that, and it's very, very alkaline, adding water to that, that bag uh, uh, that is transported all that way, all that stray ammonia that may be okay right now may all be released and it could kill everything in this tank. So you need to know what your water chemistry is before going in. What I like to do is, generally I know the water chemistry of where I'm coming from. I often carry uh, some testing equipment or ask a local, find out what their water chemistry is like, finding where it's coming from. And then I take whatever's in my bag and I'll probably dump it into a little Tupperware or a little bucket or something like that. Something that's easy to work with and contained. And then I will use a set up a drip line. And that way I'm going to be dripping from the tank and I'll drip it depending on the sensitivity of that species or how different the water chemistry is. Then I might drip it for a very, very long period of time. If it's a species that's very, very tolerant of uh, changes in, in chemistry and so forth, it's a very easy species, then I, I might drip it a lot faster. It might only take half an hour versus several hours. It depends on all those factors. So always value those factors. Each one, don't know what your water chemistry is, know what type of species you're dealing with. If it's something really, really uncommon and really, really rare, it's not gonna hurt. Take longer, the longer the better. The slower the transitional period is always gonna be better. So if you've got lots of time on your hands, by all means, take it. I've dripped some species that I've brought in from overseas, a very, very delicate fish over the years that I literally dripped overnight. So the lower, the slower the period, the better for the fish. Now, when you're dealing with breather bags, a lot of people originally used to just take the bag and float it in their tank to get the temperature right and then do the thing. You do that with a breather bag, you're going to kill the, the habitant of the breather bag. You can't do that because you will basically close off all the oxygen from this bag entirely, you'll suffocate the fish within its own bag. So this one you do, any of the breather bags, no matter what it is, you do have to put them in little buckets. You have to open up the bags, put them into little containers and stuff like that, and then drip them. And that's the only way that you can properly do breather bags without hurting the fish. 
and that way you can drip them again same thing as long as you like depending on the species the delicateness of the species the vast water condemnable tree differences and that's about it so now I'm going to just set up a quick little drip for these little guys these are both Central American cichlids, so they're both very, very tall and have vast water chemistry changes. And the place that they're coming from, I know the water chemistry there is not that far different from one I can give here. Now home, my water chemistry coming out of the ground is, 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 is really, really alkaline, very, very high pH. And uh, it's not much different from his place. But also, I manufacture water, so I can manufacture 180 gallons a day. I can provide any water chemistry that I want. If I want really, really soft species, I can bring it down gradually. I can uh, drip it to soft. I can drip it to hard. I can add stuff. Whatever we need to do, I can manufacture that. However, that's not what most of you guys can do. Most people don't have an infinite water supply of RO water, reverse osmosis water, and they just have to use the water that they've got. Then it becomes, you should know your water, and you should know the water you've got. Now also a factor is, if it's been a long time in transport, and you knew what the water chemistry was of the water that you were there, and you know the chemistry of the water you have at home, that's two very important things. However, if you've been in transport for a lot longer, you're exposed to a lot of delays that you weren't expecting, you better test the water that's in that bag when you put them into buckets, or in the big bags too. Anything that you're gonna use, Test the water of that. Find out what the pH of that water is. Find out what the ammonia level is. Find out what your nitrate levels are. Uh, be, and as you dilute those things, that's good. However, if, if you're dealing with high pH and there's all that ammonia and it's in check and all of a sudden you change that pH, that ammonia could be released into the water and you could kill everything in the bucket quickly. So check your water parameters, know what you're dealing with, and drip them slow. So we're going to set up for that next. Now this tank, the, do the top 160, I moved all the Criba Heroes uh, Basingai that I'd gotten from uh, Max Cichlids from one of the 40 breeders over here. Just before going, I had moved them all into this tank. And they've been doing great and everything like that. There's, there's just them. There's a little group of Spinocismus. They're growing up still. They're really, really slow growing fish. And those were a gift from uh, Karen Haas and Alan Rowlings down in PA, some amazing, amazing breeders. And those guys are doing good as well. And then the only other thing that's still in here is still some of the mollies that we brought back from Florida. Now, normally, if you're gonna be transporting, if it's something you bought at a store, or it's something you bought in an auction and it's unknown, or it's shown any sort of health issues or anything like that, or if your chemistry is vastly different, you would probably be wise to set up in a, in, a, in a quarantine tank, a small tank where you can isolate the species, take observ observation for a few weeks before introducing them to one of your normally existing tanks. I do have some tanks in my hatchery and stuff, but most of the stuff is good. And the fish that I'm bringing in today, I know the source. I was there. I just left there earlier this morning. We just bagged them up. I have no issues whatsoever. So it might be foolish on my behalf to introduce them into this existing tank, but they're about the same size as these guys here. They're a little bit more aggressive than you guys, and I'm, I'm a little bit more fearful that if I introduce them into a tank just by themselves, that they're going to start pecking each one off individually. And this one here, because I got lots of little dithers and it's a nice big tank with lots of cover, this is a better option for me. So this is the way I'm going to go. So for a drip tube, it's basically a large piece of airline. I use an air stone on one end because the tank's high up in the air and it gives a nice little weight to it. And it goes into the tank and it's nothing really fancy at all. And uh, you could actually hold it with a clamp. You can hold it with a clothespin. It's really, really nothing fancy. And I know a lot of the people out there are like, oh, I don't have to start a siphon that way. Well, Biggs does and Biggs doesn't care. Okay? So we got the siphon going. It's nothing exciting. Okay? To slow the siphon down, all you got to do is pinch it into a little knot. And then you can control that rate that that stuff is coming out at your own you want it to be faster or slower i can get it down to literally an individual drip no problem at all now the breather bags are decidedly more expensive than the normal bags so most people usually will try to take them apart i try to take them apart but i'm you know, i'm not usually very successful at them because i tend to tie them pretty tightly and um a lot of people could use elastics, but usually when I'm in the field and, I, and I'm doing a lot, I end up using a lot of elastics and then my hands get just raw. So I'm going to just basically probably just cut these open and make sure they go into the tub, land them all in the tub, take only most of the water out so there's really just enough to cover the fish. And then we're going to let it drip for a bit and then we'll land the fish.
Here's that polyfilter I was telling you about. It's available online. I've had this piece probably for about five years. The original piece was the size of the bag. You can see it was probably about an inch taller. The name of the bag, the name of it is actually missing and I cut it there. But this is the product. It's basically a sponge. And uh, I'd say I've used this for five years and I still have at least a year or two's worth for the amount of fish that I move around back and forth. And for transporting one of these fish in these one of these breather bags, that's how much I need. Just absolutely bare minimal. If you put too much polyfilter in a bag, too big of a piece, it'll kill the fish. I was able to save a few of the bags because Biggs tried to be patient and, and untie the knots, and he saved three of them. Because I'm not normally known as patient. You can ask my wife. No, not patient. Patient, not a virtue Biggs has. But Biggs has no choice now because the fish are dripping. So let's take a look at that. So you can see the, the, the knot in, 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 the, in the line. And I showed you guys that it's, it's just dripping. It's dripping a little bit slower. And there's those fish. And I've reduced the water level from their bags. So they've only got about a you know, three quarters of an inch of cover. And I'll let that drip until it comes up near the top. Now the tanks are on the automatic water changer system. So I've actually opened the water changer system. And that way the autumn changer system will uh, refill the water so the tank's not ever going to run low or the pump run won't run, run low while I'm slowly dripping water out. We'll come back and look at these guys in about an hour and we'll land them in the tank. Now one of the other things I was able to bring back, which is always you know, the one thing that always gets me flagged at the airport, always, and I always I declare everything. I'm, I'm, I'm a Nexus Card member, so I go through uh, enough airports that to me I'm declaring absolutely everything. When you look like me, Makes good sense. Makes good sense for everybody. But my buddy's place has a massive magnolia tree. Look at my cool new botanicals I brought back. They're nice thick leaves. They're perfect. They give that tropical kind of look. They don't look like an oak leaf. But I grabbed, I don't even know how many, a couple of dozen. But we're going to put some nice magnolia leaves into the tanks. I think that's just another cool botanical. And they'll hold up fairly well, I think. Maybe even the shrimpies will like them. Don't really know. So I got my cool leaves, got some cool fish. They're dripping. We're going to look at them in a bit. So one thing that I like to do always, remember I told you guys, you normally you float your bags and stuff. Well, you can't do that when you're doing the breather bags. So I use my uh, infrared temp gun. I usually use it for my barbecue for my big green egg. But uh, for the fish tanks and stuff, it gives me a quick read. 70... 77. 77 degrees in that tank. A little bit warm. And the water in the bucket is 76.2. So we're not far off temperature wise. Theoretically, that, that degree difference, I could probably, if they're already adjusted to chemistry, I could probably just release them. But we can still let them drip for a little bit more. The bucket's still got another inch or so to go in, temp, in, uh, in the, the area that I usually use for dripping. So it's good to go for a little bit. We're going to test the other one. Temp guns are fun to play with. Okay, well, it's been over well over half an hour now. See my water level in my in my uh, filter system's gone down a little bit, so I'm going to turn the water changer back on manually just a little bit to kind of top it all up. It's quick and easy. I just pull that handle that I've shown you before in that video about the water changer, so it's running automatically. Otherwise, I can just kind of bypass it. So, don't need my uh, drip tube anymore. The water's up now. These fish. You know, if you're transporting fish, they're under a little bit of stress. When you're adding them into the into the into the water, there you might want to use some additives. Some of the things they'll uh, help inhibit, uh, uh, such as like uh, adding Amquel or Stress Coat or something like that to help to rebuild the, the the slime coat. And then when I transfer them to the tank, I'm going to use my brine shrimp net. I have several of them, but I'm going to use a nice soft net and give them the best chances as I transfer them into the tank. Caught most of them with the one swip. And there they go. And we're going to let them kind of settle in. And the most important thing, the most critical thing, in my opinion, is that 
After you land new fish, unless you're planning on taking the whole tank apart and moving everything around, especially when we're dealing with things like cichlids and big aggressive things, is what I do next is I turn the lights off on the tank. Turning the lights off on the tank basically says the fish like, oh, it's over already, we go to bed now, and that's what's going to happen. So those new guys got a chance to kind of like de-stress, they're probably breathing really heavy, they're going to find a nice little spot to hide under a log and relax. And the next morning they'll wake up and kind of explore the environment with everybody else and nobody's the, the wiser that these new guys have shown up and it gives them a much better chance of success.